I'd like to give you a perspective on nasal alveolar molding uh, over the 30 years that I've been involved with it, and more or less the 30 or 35 years that it's been in existence. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest. Nasal alveolar molding is an appliance designed to make the job of the surgeon easier. What we like to think we're doing is anatomically putting back the pieces of the alveolus and expanding the nasal lining and uh, repositioning the nasal cartilages to a more favorable anatomic relationship so that the surgeon has to do less surgery, less surgery usually, uh, or, or less extensive surgery, which results in less undermining of uh, tissues, which leads to less uh, scarring, which we know leads to less growth restriction. So this is an example of a nasal alveolar molding appliance. There's an oral component and there's a nasal component um, the oral uh, segment is bringing the cleft alveolar segments together while the nasal component is uh, expanding inside the nose. Uh, the primary objective of nasal alveolar molding is to reduce the severity of the cleft. And uh, we're reminded that ultimately what we're working on is uh, getting a patient to not be a patient, but there's a child inside of each of these infants and they're not just here for us to generate very pretty slides and give um, important talks, but we should be focusing on the fact that these kids have a life outside of being uh, clinical subjects. Um, the history of nasal alveolar molding is very often forgotten now that's a pretty well established technique uh, practiced by probably 75 to 80 percent of all uh, cleft centers throughout the world in some fashion, but it goes back into the 1980s when there was a pin retained appliance. In 1980, I was just getting into dental school and that was a time when we were told that infants don't feel pain. It's okay to put a pin retained appliance into the palate without any anesthesia. Uh, there are tooth buds up there that we have to worry about. And it was a little bit of a gruesome appliance that under traction would rapidly bring these pieces of the cleft maxilla together and we now know that that induces um, pretty severe uh, growth restrictions and we just kind of kick the can down the road for craniofacial or maxillofacial problems later on in life. Around the same time, the Japanese uh, reported on devices for um, reestablishing normal contour for auricular cartilage by placing this framework into the deformed ear during a, a, a plastic period uh, after birth in the, uh, the neonatal period, and we could affect positive changes that, are, that hold up over time. They also did the same for um, a, a nasal stent purely uh, in a cleft uh, nose without any oral component. So while we kind of eschewed the idea of putting a pin retained appliance, we were using just an oral appliance to mold the pieces of the alveolar segments without paying any attention to the nasal component in the mid 80s. And we could very nicely take the cleft maxilla, the alveolar segments and put them in a more ideal relationship again so that the surgeon didn't have to do a lot of undermining to be able to co-op um, tiny flaps on either side of the cleft. So it became kind of a no-brainer to not use a pin-retained appliance, but take a non-pin-retained oral appliance, a passive appliance, and marry it to some sort of stent which would mold cartilage. And that's how we came up with the concept. Dr. Barry Grayson and uh, Dr. Court Cutting, who I had the privilege to study under, to come up with this non-pin-retained -retain, nasal alveolar molding appliance, which took care of both the oral components as well as the nasal components. And if we look over the 30, 35 years of employing this technique, you can see as we learned more about this, we had the form and the function of the appliance become much more elegant and much more efficient. So we were struggling to figure out what was going on in the early 90s. <clears throat> we saw some positive results and we would have this entirely hand constructed by placing drops of acrylic on top of one another to get this kind of swan neck um, formation that had to go in a precise position inside the nostril into what we're doing nowadays and little bits of refinement on this where we'll take an 
036 wire bend it into position we have some flexibility and we have potential energy built into that wire that gets transferred to the nasal cartilages to uh, affect the changes we would like to have on a bilateral appliance those of you that are original um, Star Trekkies you can see that this always reminded me of some Klingon warship <laughs> Uh, and we're just kind of cobbling together the components to mold the oral segments as well as try to figure out what to do with the nasal se segment. And then again, over time, we refined it. We put this elastic band across at the um, lip columella junction to direct the forces of expansion. Essentially, when we're, we're expanding uh, the nose, we're doing custom tissue expansion for our surgeons. And we're trying to make sure we don't create a uh, a columella that is too wide, too broad. We're not trying to pull in the skin that's uh, internal to the nostril or make a bulbous dome, but there's a real purpose to where we're going with our forces. Uh, and this is more or less what we've been working with for probably the last 15 years or so in terms of our design for a nasoalveolar molding appliance for a bilateral patient. Here you can see um, a, an appliance on a baby that we're working on currently, right? We start out first by molding the oral segments. We get the pieces close enough together. We add on the nasal segments, and then we continue oral molding as well as nasal molding to try to get symmetry and, uh, again, approximate as normal anatomy as um, possible. So the process is we do our examination. Again, we're often meeting the parents before the baby's even born to answer questions, let them have some bonding with us. The role of someone like Shelly is kind of, you may think is downplayed, but she is the ambassador that helps people decide whether we are a fit for them and their baby. And she's literally at the hospital, at the bedside, when these infants are born, showing that there are people that really care about what's going on with their child. So we will still do an analog impression, even in a digital world. We will uh, generate a cast from that, a stone cast. And at this point, we will digitize the cast and then uh, develop the molding device. And over time, we add on the nasal stent. Even though there are very elegant digital techniques, you go to your dentist, you need a crown, you need something restored. They're going to take a wand, a 3D camera. They're going to take a picture of your tooth. Mm -hmm and they're gonna send it off to a lab and they spit out a crown. You cannot digitize a cleft uh, maxilla because the, the camera, the digital capture device cannot read the void and it cannot read moving uh, mucosa. So you may read papers that you have a digital pathway but there is in fact no truly accurate digital pathway to achieve the molding appliance. Uh, once we have image capture from a scanned digitized cast or digitized the impression, at that point we can dump it into a digital pathway and mill out um, uh, uh, by computer what the form of that device should be using very, very controlled materials that are smooth, have low toxicity of components in them, and what we've anecdotally noticed over the last five years of doing it this way is that the baby has much, much, um, many, many fewer uh, sores or complications. Um, hopefully, Steve Warren will talk about this, but you know, another innovation is a combination of doing nasoalveolar molding, the repair, and then in addition of some sort of um, Botox injection to the muscles that might influence uh, tension on the surgical scar, leading to some absolutely um, magnificent and almost unperceptible um, uh, results with minimal scarring. Um, and Steve, you may even have a picture of Charlie, what, he's like 10 now or something like that. Um, for bilateral patient, uh, the usual protocol, again, is put the pieces in the midline, get some more lining for the surgeon, stretch the columella, and the key is that there is no incision at the lip uh, columella junction, which would, again leads to scarring and growth restriction. Uh, here we can see the premaxilla has been placed into the midline position. We're now moving into the nasal structures and the, the device is placing force superiorly, medially while we're pulling down on the uh, prolabium. And over time, it's usually about four to six months that we mold a bilateral patient, uh, 
Um, we're going to see a very nice maintenance, we know from the literature, which we don't have time to go into in any depth, but this uh, is something that holds up over time, and we've studied through at least age 15 with really good results tracking Farkas norms uh, for facial growth. So if we look at the protocols where we are, uh, traditionally some centers do a lip adhesion in early surgery, which we do not do. do. We'll start molding um, for three months in a unilateral for about four to six for a bilateral, and we try to get going as soon after birth as possible. We then have a formal lip, nose, and gingival repair, if appropriate, uh, in a one-stage operation at three to six months. When speech kicks in, there's palate repair at about a year. Um, many centers rely on pharyngeal flaps to improve speech, which is something that's almost we never see <laughs> for the most part uh, on our team. Um, similarly, NAM is going to influence the aesthetics of the oronasal complex, and we have fewer requests from parents to please uh, improve aesthetics with another surgery. What is notable that if this is done properly, um, you could probably get about a 75% reduction in the need for uh, alveolar bone grafting to get a bridge across the cleft gap uh, for unilaterals and about a 40 to 45% reduction for bilaterals. Uh, we appear to have a reduced need for Lafort surgery. We've just tightened up the variance in that group that does wind up having it. Um, everybody gets a rhinoplasty because we can't we can't um, mitigate the fact that the septum is going to have been elongated and bent. And then it actually makes my job on the restorative side of my uh, dental life a lot easier. Um, what are the keys to successful treatment of NAM? As Shelley alluded to this, the surgeon needs to have bought in and not necessarily be the controlling factor early on, and also needs to have the skills to unwind what we've given them, um, a different surgical technique. You need to have a dental staff that's truly passionate and motivated to provide this care. It's a labor of love. It's very labor intensive. We're seeing the baby once a week for, again, three to uh, six months. And the parents, you know, what I usually say is you have your baby for 167 hours this week and we have your baby for one hour. So they need to be kind of player coaches and, and I tell them really our job is to help coach you through this and we are available uh, to you. Um, so it's a one-third, one-third, one-third deal, as um, Dr. Cutting used to say, but really it's probably like four-fifths the parents. Um, so some final thoughts. The infant that we're going to see today, in a couple of weeks, we're going to start on a, two or three babies. Uh, that care is not going to be completed until that child is in their 20s. The baby that I start molding on uh, in, in a week, I will not probably be the person to complete their care in, in 20 years. Um, and it's a team effort, and it's years of dedication and uh, passion, and that's why I think if you want to engage in this highly rewarding area of medicine and surgery and dentistry, that you have to bring um, skills as well as passion to the game. So therefore, plan for the long term, and you should provide the best possible care from the onset uh, wherever you can, because this is the first opportunity to paint on the canvas of uh, a baby's face. I'm going to leave you with that. Uh, if there are any questions, be happy to take a couple. Thank you.